It is indeed my honor to ask you to join me in welcoming the Honorable Juan Torreya. I see I have my wife's advice here. It says, speak loud and clear. <laughs> Good morning to all. And a very warm uh, hello to the law school class of 2014 and to those who have supported them, both materially and spiritually, throughout three years of arduous intellectual endeavors. To Dina Rook, congratulations on her inspiring words and my sincere thanks for the generous introduction, and even more, for giving me the, uh, the great uh, pleasure of returning to an institution that is close to my heart and which has had such a central role in my professional formation. I am particularly honored to be a participant in this important moment in the lives of those who will be graduating today and receiving diplomas. Related to this, I would like to uh, begin my remarks by recognizing publicly those who in a very fundamental way are directly responsible for the graduating class being here today. It is their guidance and mentorship that in a very real and positive way has forever changed their lives, made them into the excellent professionals which they undoubtedly have become and will sub follow them throughout their careers from now on. I am, of course, referring to the faculty of the Boston University School of Law. This faculty has once again been ranked by the Princeton Review as the best in the nation. For those of you who may be unaware, this marks the seventh consecutive year that the BU Law School faculty has been placed among the top three in the nation, having earned a dominant first five times since the 2008 edition of this survey by the Princeton Review. I would ask all of you to please give them a big hand. On their behalf, I thank you. I must confess that I had a hard time deciding what I would talk to you about today, conscious of the fact that this uh, audience is undoubtedly ready to party, not to hear a litany from an old fogey. <laughs> my apprehension was uh, no less dampened by my recollection of my last experience as a commencement speaker at this law school back in 1985 shortly after I was elevated to the Court of Appeals, and I still thought I was an important person. On that occasion, the only time the audience clapped was when I said, and my last point. <laughs> to be honest, in retrospect, I cannot say I blame them uh, because of the lack of enthusiasm for my long-winded remarks. With this in mind, I decided I would consult my law clerks and interns several of whom are either be recent BU graduates or are still attending the law school, to get their views as to what they thought I might be, interest, might be of interest to this audience. After some debate, the most prominent subject turned out to be the law school's building. <laughs> well, how the building was described will give you an idea as to how the conversation went. It was called, quote, a 17th floor basement. <laughs> a charming collectivist block for Soviet laborers in 1980 Leningrad. <laughs> that the best thing about it was when you were in it because you couldn't see it. <laughs> well, I'll, I will reserve the rest of the remarks for some other occasion. 
Well, I quickly became aware that uh, for several reasons I would by bypass the, the building theme. The first was that if I criticize the building too much or emphatically, Dean O'Rourke might appoint me to preside over a fundraising committee for the new building, <laughs> an honor which I wish to avoid at all costs, no pun intended. The second was a more mundane reason, brought about by the obvious genera the generational gap between myself and my agenda-inspired uh, advisors. It became, it became clear to me that their uh, main concern about the law school building was grounded on aesthetics, a laudable uh, viewpoint, but quite different from my own. <laughs> For me, it is the building's plumbing that most concerns me. <laughs> For having suffered through the anxious experience of having to rush from the seventh floor to the basement aboard a jam-packed and tropically slow elevator that stopped at every floor to reach the men's room, I was NM hoping that the new building will meet the urgent needs of older alumni in locating more abundant facilities throughout. <laughs> a third and more consequential reason is that, of course, it is the content of the bottle that is more important, not its shape. Irrespective of the magnificence of the new law school's physical structure, as I have already partially commented upon, the content of, of those who inhabit the BU Law School's building are the school's most impressive and enduring asset. Of course, this not only includes the faculty and the supporting staff, but also its students. I can tell you without any hesitation, after 40 years picking and hiring law clerks from all over the country and from the whole gamut of law schools, BU graduates stand up to any litmus test that I know of. They compete favorably against the best of the best and are getting better every year. I say this not because I'm your guest or notwithstanding my obvious prejudices, but because it is the truth. Which leads me to the next point. It seems to me that it would be a productive undertaking if I use this opportunity to perhaps help to allay the possible insecurities that you may be experiencing as you approach and jump into the real world that awaits you. Although I may be using some common cliches, in more figuratively than once, today is the beginning of a new chapter in your lives. And all of you, or at least some of you, may be asking yourselves, what, what will be the other chapters of this book, uh, given the many uncertainties that seem prevalent today? Some of you might still be app apprehensive about your immediate employment prospects not to mention your long-range long future. Let me start by saying the obvious. You attended and graduated from a great law school. This alone should serve to give you confidence in yourselves and to assure you that you are, at a minimum, academically well prepared for a lifetime of rewarding and important work, whatever may be your immediate situation or your present pr uh, prospects. Still, I know it may be difficult, even on a day of celebration, to remove from your thoughts the seemingly omnipresent, uh, omnipresent tales of woe about the legal economy. For example, here's a happy quote from the ever cheery New York Times. As the sour corporate climate reached large law firms, a bubble burst with business down Several of the most famous law firms have dismissed substantial numbers of lawyers, particularly those in their early years of their careers. The layoffs have left many of the young lawyers feeling betrayed by institutions which they charge, courted them, exploited them, and their, lo and their lo loyalty, and worked them incessantly, only to dump them when times got tough. Sound familiar? I'm sure you've read recent articles. In fact, there was an article uh, three days ago in, in the uh, Boston Globe by uh, Jeff Jacoby. And yesterday, there were two letters to the editors, more or less chanting the same uh, doom and gloom uh, uh, 
attitude and saying that there were too many lawyers already. You might be wondering why I chose to speak to you about this subject on a day which should be only a happy day. Uh, but let me tell you, the, the, the quote I just made from the New York Times, you know what it was from? From August 12, 1990 edition, 24 years ago. What does this all mean? It means that we've been through this before and that we've survived and progressed, notwithstanding the doomsayers. The business cycle and the fortunes of its camp flowers, the big law firms, are the most subject to these cycles. And they come back at the turn of the economic wheel. Keep in mind, business cycles are just that, cycles. If today's economy is a little lethargic, it will sooner or later rise, or later rise again. Lawyers will always be needed at both peaks and the trough of the economic turn, even if it's bankruptcy specialists at the lower part. Hence, perspective is important. Don't allow the gloom and doom predictors to cloud your outlook on the future. With your academic dossier, a bit of patience and perseverance, I have no doubt but that you will achieve whatever personal and professional goals you have set yourself on yourselves. And trust me, looking back in a few years, you will find that even if the road has dipped and turned at times, your law degree will be invaluable in your having attained a successful and satisfying professional life. If I have learned one thing from my own career, it is to appreciate the incredible versatility of a law degree. Indeed, what do Mahatma Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, Michelle Obama, and Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, among others, have in common? If you set a legal education, you won the prize. For, and the legal education is a great prize for all who are fortunate enough to have one, for it is a fantastic arrow in your quiver. It will help open doors, not only in the purely legal field, but also in many fields other than strictly that of practicing law, if that is uh, the path you decide. I can tell you that within three years of my law school graduation, over 50% or close to 50% of my classmates were engaged in work other than strictly legal. That is not lawyering in the classic sense, but were engaged in uh, uh, work requiring uh, legal skills or background. They were banking, in banking, in diverse management jobs in private industry and government, teaching, etc., etc. It is no accident that many political leaders, authors, journalists, teachers, business executives all have law degrees. There's a multitude of careers that require the communication skills and confident public presence of a well-trained lawyer that require the attention to detail and capacity to analyze complex problems that are characteristic of law school, law school training. And within the law itself, a need remains. Whatever the economic state, for those that are legally trained, modern society demands that there be individuals trained to interpret and administer the mountain of laws, rules, and regulations that impinge impinge on every aspect of our lives. And as we contemplate this, the future, don't forget the time-honored practice of hanging a shingle, a shingle as a solo practitioner. Some of the best and most economically rewarding years of my legal career were those as a solo private practitioner. With the proliferation and rel rel relatively low cost of electronics, there's a growing number of single practitioners able, able to compete, operate from their homes and small offices without the need to pay crippling rents or to keep expensive, space-consuming libraries that burden you with non-productive costs. Solo practitioners are able to operate effectively with a mere touch of, a finger, of fingertips on a well-connected laptop, hopefully better than I who always put, put the wrong button down. As I have to add, 
There's, there's something that, to be added to that, which is that there's a great personal satisfaction to making it on your own and not a considerable ego-building factor to keep in mind. Whatever, whatever your path leads, what I wish to emphasize is the indispensability of lawyers. I'm sure there's not one person in this audience who has not heard or told a lawyer joke, mostly of a derogatory uh, nature. Heck, lawyers are the first ones to, to tell them. Shakespeare's famous quote, kill all the lawyers, is better known than the, 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 the play itself from where it comes. Yet there are few who would seriously consider a democratic society like ours without lawyers, even with all our faults. Lawyers and are and will be necessary to stand between the less fortunate and the more fortunate, or as a shield against the occasional oppressive acts of government. And of course, we all know all the other reasons why we need lawyers at different times. Both personally and institutionally, we need the stability that a legal system brings. It is lawyers in their various roles within our society that are critical to bringing social stability. There is plenty of room for all of you, all of you. You are all needed. And I, for one, am more than honored to welcome today's graduates to our interesting, rewarding, and most fascinating profession. Thus, I end my remarks by asking the class of 2014 to please rise. Let's give him a big hand. Congratulations, graduates. Thank you for your patience, and may the force be with you. And don't forget, and don't forget to smell the roses on the way. Thank you. <laughs>